Welcome to The Open Door. Jim Hannick here with co-host Mario Ramos-Reyes. And we hope Valerie Niemeyer waiting in the wings. Today, we discuss the progress of the American Solidarity Party and current presidential and vice presidential campaign of Peter Sonsky and Lauren Onak. Our special and most welcome guest is Marcos Lopez, the chair of the American Solidarity Party. A first generation Cuban American, he's a husband and a father of two and lives in Tampa, Florida. He raises mosquitoes as a hobby. <laughs> More relevant. Lopez holds a bachelor's degree in English from the University of South Florida. He works in marketing and spends most of his free time with his family. He's also involved with music, music ministry at his parish. As always, let's begin in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who have taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that in the same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Well, I want to get right to the the key the key statistic is it true marcos is it true that the fastest growing party political party in the united states is our own american solidarity party and if that's true and it must be true tell us <laughs> it's true what accounts for its growth so my recollection on the veracity of that claim is based on the number of votes that we garnered in the 2020 election um, compared to what we did before, right? I, I think the, that statistic comes from however many votes we got in 2016 with Mike Maturin to then how many we ended up getting um, in 2020 with Brian Carroll. So in that sense, yes, right? Um, I would say in terms of membership, you know, fascist growing in terms of membership, um, forward party, you know, is probably now, right? The fastest growing party um in terms of membership and things like that um, but they've never run a candidate have they? But they've never, right but they've never run a candidate so this is forward you know. they call this forward huh i call yes. it stuck. Yeah. they're they're moving the you know they're moving the money forward but nothing else um so in that sense right like you know there are other political parties that that you could say are going faster um but we are certainly the only political party that's that's doing things right um outside of you know the the major major parties and then the larger third parties you know like libertarians greens um things like that um and i think in terms of accounting for its growth right um i i was on a twitter space a few days ago um with peter actually and this question was was raised um in kind of like an informal interview and you know the answer i gave was that we're a party that attracts a very, very specific um, and very, very dedicated demographic of people. And that's people who are serious about their faith, right? Our party, our values, our platform appeals to people who really feel like their faith is not reflected in, in the American political dynamic currently. And they're looking for something else. Um, and we are there for them, right? That's, that's what that's what we really attract is people who are serious about their faith, people who are disappointed with how politics are going in America. And they feel like neither party is really a place for them to, you know, hang their hat because they know that both parties and other third parties have real major issues that create conflict between people's faith and their politics. And in lots of ways, we're a refuge for those people, right? People who are pro-life, people who, have traditional moral uh, values, don't feel at home anywhere else because they're not welcome, you know, and we're seeing that even in the Republican Party, 
right? You know, a lot of these this pro-life backlash that we're seeing, um, very prominent uh, Republican talking heads like Ann Coulter are spending time bashing pro-lifers. Um, we saw Donald Trump, you know, talk about how, uh, you know, abortion bans in certain states like Florida were a mistake. Um, so we're seeing that people who value their faith and who want to see their politics reflect that are increasingly unwelcome in any of the parties that are really there right now. Um, and I think that's really where our strength lies, right? There is a, a population of people in America who really care about this. And if we can just reach them, if we can just get to them, get them our message, they're with us. You know, it's, it's definitely our strength there. And I think that's what really accounts for our growth, for our dedication, for our infrastructure is really people who are serious about politics and serious about wanting to see real change in America. Well, what better demographic could we appeal to? What better demographic? Well, I would say... Uh, they're the people we want, right? Right, exactly. You know, they're, they're the ones we want. And, you know, I always say that, that that's where really our focus should be. And in a situation where, you know, let's say we get 1% of the electoral vote, right? We get 1% of the national vote because people who are serious about their faith, people who want to see the ASP's values flourish, jump on board, right? Once we get to that status, we can take a look at things and try to form coalitions, try to, uh, you know, build consensus with other third parties on common ground issues, right, to, to hopefully advance the cause. But, you know, until we get to the point where we really have a large amount of influence throughout the country, we don't need to be worrying about appealing to anyone else, right? Like, we need to appeal to the people who like our values, who are looking for our values, um, and who want to find somewhere where they can, you know, where they can feel like they're at home politically. Now, I want to backtrack just a bit on the statistics. Is it the case that the Republican Party is actually losing the members and that that's so for the Democratic Party as well? Yeah, definitely. So we've definitely seen over the last you know, several decades, honestly, um, increasing amounts of America, increasing numbers of Americans are uh, doing, uh, you know, no party affiliation, independent affiliation, um, libertarian, right, green. So third parties really are growing in America. Um, they're growing. Some of them are growing more than others. You know, some are in decline because a new party comes up that kind of does their thing better. Um, but it's certainly true that for a long time, and especially now, that Americans are increasingly separating themselves, um, formally at least, right, from the major parties. We still see that voting patterns reflect that people are, at the end of the day, more likely to pick one of the major candidates, even if they're an independent, even if they're a libertarian, or even if they're a green, right? People, you know, once it gets to <laughs> early November, uh, they're like, okay, well, I'm just going to vote for, you know, the guy that I think is better. Um, but at least in the formal sense, and if you ask people and their affiliations and voter registrations, those parties are getting smaller, for sure. One, one last question here, and then Mario is poised, I can tell. <laughs> you can see that he's ready. <laughs> Many's the time I've heard uh, a pastor or read from a bishop that a Catholic... And of course, our party has many evangelicals as well. But that a Catholic isn't really at home with either Democrats or Republicans. And that we have to be discerning. Well, don't we want to say to said pastor or bishop, yes, we're for discernment. And here we are. It's not as if you have to choose between one evil or another evil. Here's a party that you can embrace. Mm -hmm. Are we ever going to hear that, Marcos? Are we ever going to hear that? That they say, ah, yes, postscript to my last sermon, postscript <laughs> to my last pastoral letter. There is a party that we encourage you to explore. Yeah, I, I think we I think we will. And I think we are seeing that. 
Um, a great example, uh, you know, a good friend of the party who has a large platform, Father Joseph Krupp, um, over in Michigan. He has a radio show. He, uh, you know, does social media presence. He writes blogs. He writes articles. He's a great friend of the party, and he is always promoting us there. He's talking about the party. He's, you know, sharing our stuff on social media, and he has 30,000 followers on Twitter, maybe 28,000 followers on Twitter. Um, I know... For a fact, we definitely have prominent clergy members who are voting members of the party. I won't disclose who they are, um, but you know, we're, ah. <laughs> we're we're seeing a lot of um, a lot of traction in that area, right? You, we have a lot of clergy members, uh, especially yeah, Protestant evangelical clergy, uh, you know, Catholic clergy, Orthodox clergy. Um, those people really are present in the party and, and present in the parties. Um, you know, governance, right? You know, these people vote in elections, these people vote um, for candidates, they, I'm sure many of them voted in our primary, you know, for the presidential candidates. Um, and we're seeing this general shift, I think, among the prominent religious people, uh, religious leaders in the country, of wanting another option and wanting to see something else. I was reading, um, the name of the book escapes me, I was reading a, a collection of essays by Bishop Barron um, a few weeks ago, and he had a whole essay talking about how neither political party really fits with Catholic social teaching. He addresses, he said it's true. He said, we really have an issue. He referenced distributism <laughs> in the essay talking about how this is really something that we could get behind, you know, the, you know, the GK Chesterton, uh, you know, references really res resonated with me, of course, because I was reading it. I was like, he's talking about us. He just doesn't even know it. Or he does know it, and he's he's kind of having a hard time, you know, dealing with the powers that be in terms of navigating um, that political landscape. Because I'm sure, in just like in everything else in the in the you know in the curia and in uh, you know Catholic politics, um, there's politics to what you say, what you don't say. Um, so I, I think people know we're here. I, I I'm inclined to think that people who are in leadership know we're here. They like us, they support us even privately. Um, and I think we're gonna continue to see people come out of the woodwork to, to give us some good words. Excellent. Mario. Very interesting. Um, you are saying that there are clergy who are sympathetic to our party. Now, the issue there is how then we distinguish between clerical party and a lay party. <clears throat> Otherwise, people are going, to be, <clears throat> are going to accuse us of being theocratic and all these things, which has been the case for years and years and years in many parts of Latin America and even Europe. So that is a very delicate issue because we need to be aware that there is a mediation between what is called Catholic social teaching and politics. It's not just coming from principle and applied to reality, there are mediation. So my concern is that when we say we are distributist, so I think many Christian Democrats would say, well, there are Christian Democrats who are not distributist. There's more than that, because that is a, let's call it technique, economic technique, how to produce, how to arrange communities. But there are others, communal way of organizing according to the Catholic social teaching. And let me finish with this uh, conclusion and question. Even in Latin America, Distributism is almost impossible for the social composition of society. There are other forms that we is very close and so on. So my question is how the, the Solidarity Party, American Solidarity Party, would avoid this accusation of being theocratic or just for those who are believers and not welcoming those who may not believe in what we do? Well, 
I think that's a real concern. Uh, this has actually been a topic of discussion in some of our Facebook groups and some other thing in some other areas. The first thing I do when I deal with this stuff, and respectfully, you know, I'll push back a little bit. I think that to a very large degree, there's nothing we can do about people throwing out accusations of theocracy. <laughs> you know, we have people all around here who say, you know, like, oh, you know, you want to ban abortion. Like, you guys are just theocratic. You're trying to, you know, you're trying to let your church dictate everything. And we can't do anything about that, right? You know, at the end of the day, our, our policies were reflect our, our our convictions right our policies reflect what we believe is is the best thing for the country and that's what all other political parties are doing right Every, everyone who's in a political party everyone who's a politician is trying to advance their particular policy goals in a democratic way right in a way that uses democracy because we work in a democratic system um we're trying to win votes right um and so you know accusations of theocracy are just something we have to in my opinion something we just have to be willing to brush off you know if someone wants to call us theocrats for you know being you know in favor of traditional marriage for uh you know being pro-life for being against the death penalty then that's just how it's going to be <laughs> and you know we can say you know of course like no we, we can appeal to to natural goods right like the sanctity of human life right the value of the human being we can appeal to the societal benefits right of of uh, of incentivizing traditional marriage and stable families um and of course we do that right we we, we make those we make those cases um as they come up um but in my opinion, you know, the accusations of theocracy are really unfortunate. I, <laughs> I wish they weren't there. Um, but, but I don't think, I, th I think it's a bit of a, a trap to try to reformulate our values in a way to intentionally avoid or try to limit those accusations, right? Because the result is that they're going to call us theocrats anyway. <laughs> you know, we can make it sound super nice and sound super secular and super uh you know non-religious but at the end of the day they're going to say so you, you still want to control my body you still want to have you know you still want to dictate what marriage looks like in america and you know the question is the answer is like yes we still want to do those things right we still want to implement our policies um and you know i, I think it's frustrating you know i've been called a theocrat before i'm sure Dr. Hannick has, I'm sure you have, for being in, in the American Solidarity Party and, and for, you know, for having a, a public facing um, campaign and taking positions on things. But um, I'm not really concerned about it. I think that it comes with the territory. I think that the more we see those accusations thrown out, the less serious they become. You know, we're seeing a big uh, push for this idea of, uh, you know, Christian nationalism in the media, right? This new movie with Rob Reiner. And really, it's not talking about fascism or Christian nationalism. It's talking about Christians who want to see politics look like Christianity, right? It's like, no, you're missing the point, right? The, these accusations of um, these terms that are thrown out to try to use them as pejoratives, you know, to, to people of faith who, who want to help, you know, advance American politics. Um, it's just unfortunate, but we're going to deal with it. Does that answer your question? Yes, you did. Uh, um, why did you join the American Solidarity Party in the first place? So, <laughs> let's get, yeah. let's get going back there down memory yes. lane. And down remember, memory short term lane. memory is the first to go. <laughs> um well you know I, I i can say as a father of two young boys dad brain is a real thing there are things that i forget that just go in one ear in one ear one out the other um so if i uh if i have a brain lapse i'll blame my three-year-old um what i can say about joining the party was really that i was in a similar position as i'm sure dr hannick was you know i was someone always someone who took my faith seriously i you know, I'm a practicing Catholic. I've always gone to Mass. I've always, you know, kept up with the sacraments, gone to confession regularly. Um, you know, I, I took my faith seriously. And I didn't feel like the Republican Party, which is where I was a member, was really advancing um, any sort of policy beyond pro-life policy at the time that I felt was worth supporting. You know, I, 
I was a Catholic, I was a Republican, but I was also a, a working class person. I was a dad. I, I'm a homeowner. Um, you know, so these are things that I that I deal with, right? That I was seeing. I'm like, man, like this is crazy. This is expensive, right? You know, well, why? Why is it so hard to raise a family? You know, why is it so expensive to raise a family? Why are we having to deal with these with these issues? And you know, we're spending all this money on all kinds of other things, right? At a federal level, we're spending all kinds of money on increasing our military budget. You know, all kinds of government waste. We're spending money on billions of dollars on DEI initiatives, right? All these things. It's like, where am I in this? Right. Where, where's the support for me? Right. As, as a young person, who's a father, who's um, a working man. Um, and really through a bunch of Facebook groups, basically, I was in a bunch of, you know, Catholic political discussion, Facebook groups, and I got connected to some folks who are involved in the ASP. Just started talking to them you know, kind of became friends first, right? You know, you get, you get into like a group chat and you just talk and talk about your lives and how things are going. Um, and so I really became close to them. Uh, and then they told me about the party. They asked me to join. I joined and the rest is history. Good. Excellent. Well, there's a, a considerable distance between what you just described and becoming chair of the national committee. <laughs> how, did, how did that work out? So there's a very long answer and there's a very short answer. How about um, a medium, a medium answer. I'll, I'll try for the medium answer. Um, so obviously this year was really, really focused on the presidential campaign, right? The presidential primary was a very large focus of the party this year, of the party membership. I was deeply involved with the Peter Sonsky campaign, you know, during the primary, I was the primary point of contact. I was the person who designed the website. I, you know, was assisting with social media, you know, so in many ways I was really Peter's right-hand man for getting things done, uh, for, you know, doing some clerical tasks, doing IT stuff because, you know, <laughs> um, and so I was really there, you know, as an advisor to, you know, he and I talked really, really thoroughly about the issues, about how the, we want the campaign to go, what our goals were. And really, you know, Peter and I built a really strong friendship. We, we still have a great friendship. We talk all the time. Um, and it's and that's really, I think, where the push to to put me in the chairmanship really came from, right, was this idea of, you know, the party needs to be focusing on its own things, but also focusing on supporting the presidential campaign, right, as much as possible, and working to give them publicity, give them, you know, volunteer infrastructure, helping, you know, with various support tasks, right? And, and Peter and I talked, and we really felt that the best dynamic to make sure that the party and the campaign are advanced as much as possible is for him and I to be, you know, at the helm, um, so we can work with each other, you know, discuss things, hash things out when, when needed, right? You know, because of course there are some, you know, there's disagreements sometimes about how governance should look like and what should be done. Um, and so during the convention, you know, Peter explained his thought process. He really explained that he, you know, would like to see me in the chairmanship, that he felt that I would be a good fit, you know, to, uh, to you know, do the day in day out decision making for the party, and also kind of lead the way. And then the convention elected national committee members, and then I was elected chair. Does that answer? Is that the medium answer that you were looking for? It does. It shows yes. how, how things worked out. Mario. Yes. Uh, let's go back to something that I'm interested in knowing. Sure. You are a Cuban American, first yes. generation. Mm -hmm. So let's start with what do you mean by first generation? So my father was born in Cuba. Okay. My father was born in Cuba. Uh, my mother uh, in, in Camagüey, where my father was born. Uh, my mother, uh, her family was also from Camagüey. They came over uh, about six months before she was born. So my mother was born in Tampa, Florida six months after they came over 
to the States. Um, and so I'm a first generation American on virtue of my father's side who, who was born in Cuba and he was there until he was about four years old. So do you know the situation in Cuba? In yes. other words, the, the situation in Cuba somehow directed you to the American Solidarity Party. What do you think about that? I would say the opposite. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that, uh, you know, and I'm sure you're probably familiar with it too. Uh, you know, there's definitely a very, very strong anti socialism, anti communism, anti big government sentiment, right? Among, among, among Cuban Americans, right? And largely it's with good reason, right? I mean, we had a, a socialist regime that came in and took people's property and, you know, did a bunch of crazy stuff and left people on the street. We're separating families, you know, at points of departure. Um, you know, it was really horrible things. And so there's a lot of emotional scarring, emotional damage there, you know, that, that is still very much ingrained in, in at least my family, right? And so I would say that was actually an obstacle to, to for me joining the American Solidarity Party was this feeling of like, uh, I don't know if I, you know, want to be part of this, like, distributism kind of sounds like socialism kind of, you know, big government universal health care thing. Like, I'm not sure if that's really like what, what like my family would want, you know, things like that. And what I really did was I just, just looked at the facts. I just looked at the policies and I said, like, I really do agree with this. You know, it, it might not, it might not be what you know what my family will want or what you know my grandfathers and you know great grandfathers back in cuba would you know they'd probably look at this and be like this is socialism right um but it, you know that was an obstacle but i but i definitely moved past it you know and it was something that i had to really work through and you know and, and I, like i said in my heart i really knew that these were the right policies that we were looking for and that america needs um but i just had that very strong cultural impulse in the other direction, right? That I had to really push through. And since then it's, it's been fine. And I talk to my parents about it all the time and they're actually pretty supportive of the party and its ideas. And I think that the economic situation in the past few years has really helped, you know, discussion about that because it's like, you know, this is expensive. We can't afford things. Groceries are, you know, getting more expensive, gas. Um, and so I think that that sentiment about big government is always bad, you know, quote unquote, big government, right? Um, is always bad. This is terrible. We need to, you know, lower taxes or, you know, whatever it is that that, that sentiment's largely going away, I would say, at least in my family, because they're just seeing how much things cost and they're dealing with all these, all these expenses uh, that they're having to really work through. Let's get back to the National Committee for a bit. Great. We uh, kind of go back and forth over our, our ideas here, and one thing leads to another. Now, there's a, a monthly open to the public meeting of the yes. National Committee, and I'm sure that that's based on what's gone on in the week before that, and the week before that, and the week before that. What are some of the weekly challenges that, that you and the National Committee face? What, what, what comes up all the time? Yeah, definitely. So one of the things that comes up really often is we're in a situation now where some of the National Committee members also hold work portfolios with the party. You know, so, uh, for example, um, Jack Turnin is the outreach director, right, on top of being a National Committee member. And so a lot of the really week-to-week -week work of, of at-large National Committee members yeah. is really just relating to helping out with whatever tasks they are assigned to, whatever tasks they want to help with. Um, you know, Bill Fleming helps out with state development more often uh, because that's just where he likes to be. He doesn't have, you know, a portfolio, but he is definitely there and he helps out and that's where he spends a lot of his time. Um, the National Committee itself, and this is something I'm, I'm happy about, really. The National Committee itself, as National Committee members, really doesn't do any sort of day-in, day-out governing of the party. It's really there to oversee the large-scale 
decisions of the party and to make sound decisions about that. Right. So me as, you know, as the chairman, you know, I am vested with basically chief executive powers, of, you know, within the party, obviously there's limits. Right. Um, but I'm the one who actually deals with most of the day in day out, like, Hey, how should we do this? You know, this service is increasing its billing starting next month. Should we shop around for something else or should we keep it? Um, I do a lot of communication with Bonnie, the party administrator uh, about things that are going on. She'll say, Hey, I, you know, I went to the website. I really think we need to add this feature or I think we need to fix this because it's not working right. Um, so really like it's, it's a lot of just, I wouldn't say rubber stamping, right, for me, because I do look at it and I take it seriously and I make sure that what we're doing is sound. Um, but the National Committee, as a, as a governing body, uh, we discuss things, we talk about things that we're going to vote on, we put motions, you know, into teams to, like, hash things out before they go onto the floor for discussion. Um, but we don't really have any sort of formal week-to-week -week governance, you know, powwows, if that makes sense. Now, would you say, in light of these activities, that patience really is a virtue? Yes, I would. It's uh, things move slowly. Things definitely move slowly when there's nine people and everyone's got their own considerations. Everyone has their own perspective they're bringing. It's definitely a, a slow process to try and build consensus. Um, that's something that it's just always going to be a slow process, right? You know, you'll, you know, for example, I'll put something in and I'll say, Hey, I think this is what we should do. What do you guys think? And I'll get five different concerns about five different things. I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's try to work on all these. And we do work together. And, you know, sometimes of course there are objections that you just have, like, sometimes I'll look at it and I'll say, I don't think that's, you know, an objection that we should really address in this way. Or sometimes we'll be like, Oh, that's a really good point. Right. Let's, let's fix that. And so that process is slow and, and that's a good thing. I would say it's, it's, I would say it's a, a feature rather than a bug, right? Because when you're making decisions for the party, when you're making long-term decisions, right? Especially with spending money, things like that. It does have to be something that you're really looking at seriously. You're talking with everyone about uh, before you just decide to do something, you know, um, things like policies, things like how we should be handled stuff. That's not as, in my opinion, not as crucial to set in stone because it can always be revised, right? If the National Committee passes something that six months later they say, actually, we need to do it this other way. We don't like it. We can do that. Um, but especially with spending money, with you know making expenditures on behalf of the party, um, we really need to look at that stuff seriously, and we, and we do. So that's it definitely takes a long time. <laughs> what do you think of the, the spirituality of a, of a person who regularly prays that other people be patient while he himself focuses on different virtues. <laughs> I would say, I hope that's not me, um, <laughs> but that's all I'll say about that. All right. Mario. Gene, there is unity on the virtues. Yes, I thought you might bring that up. So your Thomism is getting weaker. <laughs> no, no, I'm in denial on on any. <laughs> okay, um, going back to politics, um, can you tell us about Peter Sonsky and Lauren Onak um, as a candidate, uh, president and vice president of the American Solidarity Party? Yeah. Uh you know, so obviously, I think Lauren's been on the show, right? Um, I don't think Peter has, has as well. Oh, back has he? Okay. The, back in the days when he was a lowly primary candidate. There you go. That's right. I forgot about that. Um, yeah. So you know, Peter and Lauren are great. Like that's the opening. They are dedicated. They're focused. Um, they are really concerned about making sure things are going well. They are always looking for media opportunities, looking for fundraising opportunities. Um, obviously you guys have seen, they've been traveling across the country. Uh, Peter especially has been doing a lot of traveling. He was in Michigan. He was in Pennsylvania. He was in, uh, Tennessee, North Carolina, Washington, DC. 
Um, he's been in Florida several times on kind of work and party business. You know, when he's come for work, we kind of make that work and I'll drive to Orlando um, to make a campaign event out of it. Um, so I'll say that they're really focused, they're really serious. And in my opinion, you know, this is me being biased, of course, because I was involved in the campaign and I, I'm, you know, close with both of them. We couldn't ask for better candidates. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I know there's a lot of discussion about, you know, and this is a later question that I know you guys can ask about, like attracting high profile people. Um, and I think at this stage in our party, high profile people are great as long as they actually are willing to hold the line on the party values, right, and promote our values, right? You know, I think in lots of cases, high profile people are, are great for us, right, as if they promote us, right? But I wouldn't necessarily want those people as our standard bearer, right? And I think Peter and Lauren are excellent about being standard bearers for the party, for practicing what they preach, um, for being available, for being transparent, and, and really for putting in a lot of work <laughs> in the campaign week in, week out. I know it's hours and hours and hours and hours and hours a week. Um, and I applaud them for that because I know I couldn't do it. <laughs> now, what about ballot access? That's critical. <sighs> yes. Uh, ballot access is terrible. <laughs> the process is terrible. Um, so ballot access is every state has a secretary of state and every state has their own election laws, their own procedures. Every secretary of state has their own procedures and policies. And our task is navigating all of those different sets of policies, all those different dates, different deadlines, different thresholds, different rules and regulations um and that's a hard job it's it's not easy uh i am quick to say that it's very banana republic-esque when you are looking at election laws and you're like wait a second we only have two weeks to collect these signatures and we have to get five thousand or you know the filing fee for getting on ballots like twenty five thousand dollars uh or a state with a low population, you know, like Connecticut, for example, they require 10,000 signatures to get on the ballot. That is an enormous expense, right? Um, and so we're doing pretty well there, actually. Um, the, the bright side is that we're navigating it pretty well. Uh, the National Committee, um, I can say this, I don't think it's, it's going to be in the minutes of the next meeting. The National Committee just approved um, an expenditure to get a thousand voter registrations in Louisiana, which once we get that done and we file everything and turn our paperwork, we will have party level access in Louisiana. So when Peter and Lauren are on the ballot there, it won't say independent. It'll say American solidarity, which is great. Um, I know, it, you know, in, in lots of other cases, when you pay as an independent candidate, it just says independent, right? Um, but that'll be awesome, right? Louisiana is a great state for us demographically. It's a great state, with lots of religious people. Um, another state that we're looking to have, we will ha have access in is Hawaii, which is great. We've got the signatures there already, and we've just got to file the paperwork. We're already on the ballot in Arkansas. Uh, that's remaining for the last uh, election cycle. We have access there still. And we're looking at other opportunities. Um, Utah is another state that um, is a likely um, state where the campaign will have access, um, you know, as independent candidates. Um, I'm sure, I'm not sure if you guys saw, RFK recently um, sued the Utah Secretary of State for having these ridiculous election laws. Um, and there was some goodwill negotiation that happened and a deadline was pushed back um, to be able to, you know, make it easier. Uh, for them to get on the ballot there and other third party candidates as well. Um, I think uh, I'm trying to think of other states there, you know, there's so many, it's, it's honestly hard to keep track. Sometimes there's a whole spreadsheet for the thresholds and things that we're looking at. Um, it's very but, interesting that oh, when the, the media discuss third party candidates, such as Cornell West, one of the very first things that comes into the discussion is, 
well, will there be time to get ballot access? Do they understand how hard it is to get ballot access? That's a core issue. Yep, and we're seeing that a lot, especially these these third party candidates who haven't been part of a political party before, right? I think Cornel West is a great example. He's prominent as a thinker, prominent as a public figure, but he's never run for office. He was not involved in a large scale campaign. And so when you walk into a presidential campaign, you go, oh my goodness, <laughs> these rules are nuts. Um, it really, it, it, it tempers your expectations quite a bit when you're looking at these things and you go, okay, so we only have so much money or we only have so much time, right? You have to prioritize. What's the highest priority? What's the best value for us? Um, and that's something that we look at too, right? It's like, okay, well, this much money, how many electoral votes does it get us in 2024 if it's party access and it's for two cycles, right? Like doing that math to really try to find the best value for us um, is a strong consideration for when we're making these decisions. I guess uh, in the last presidential election, while we did very well in Illinois and had ballot access, we were lucky to get it. We could have easily been challenged, but everybody was too distracted. Yes. All right. Mario. Moving to the marketing, you are an expert in marketing. I wouldn't say expert. I work in marketing. <laughs> well... Yeah, you are, you know more than I do. So sure. um, how the party or anyone involved in the American Solidarity Party can promote the party. Imagine you are like me who doesn't know anything about marketing and want to get out the idea of Christ, the uh, Christian Democratic Party, Catholic Social Teaching, and so on. What would be the best way to approach this need? Sure. And, and I talk about this a lot, actually. I used to be the media and marketing director for the party last year before I was the chair. Um, and it was funny because I was kind of like, it was self-deprecating and I would actually disparage my own portfolio in lots of ways because at every meeting I would say, yeah, we're posting on Facebook, we're posting on Instagram, we're posting on Twitter. But the best thing you can do to grow the party is just to talk about it to your friends and family. <laughs> like, that's it. It really is that simple. Um, of course, like things like Facebook, things like email marketing, stuff like that's helpful, right? And it gets engagement. But at the end of the day, it really is a grassroots movement and we have to act like it. We have to talk to friends and family, people who we know share the same concerns that we do, people who know who share the same values or these similar values right um i know before the delegate convention this year i got like 10 people in my friend circles to join the party you know and that's not something a social media post is going to do right it, it's using that rapport that you have with people using those friendships to really you know cash something in like hey like i really need you to support this this is great you know i really aligns with our values you know whether it's as an evangelical or as a catholic um just having those conversations is really the best thing um we have marketing we do all sorts of stuff like that um but just sitting down and just having discussions with your friends and family is way more effective than making a facebook post it's way more effective than you know flyering a town you know there's so many flyers out there there's so many marketing ads there's so much crap that we see all the time every day that we're bombarded with Having something like a political party stick out is really hard. Um, so a person-to-person -person interaction where you say, listen, I think you need to be a part of this is absolutely the most effective thing to do. And that's a good thing, right? Like that, that should be reassuring in lots of ways. You know, people who ask that, like, how, how can I help? I can tell you how you can help. <laughs> Get people to join. Talk to your friends. And that's a really easy, uh, it's a really easy task to do. There's a lot of emotional and social barriers sometimes that people have to get over. You know, I don't want to talk to my friends about politics or whatever. Um, but once you clear that barrier, it's fine. Thank you. A couple things come to mind. Uh, here in California, we have a, a physician, uh, Dr. Renee Trabanino, who is 
done some wonderful things for us. Mm-hmm. He's actually reached a market of a million people. Mm-hmm. He does it using a, a, a picture of, of a family. That's a, a very moving picture. And then along with the picture, there are a few, few basic statements about the party. And he's ingenious. Uh, you have limits about what you can advertise on Facebook. Mm-hmm. It's directly political. So one of the things he does is he advertises in in outlets that are showing soccer games. <laughs> <laughs> and lots of people are watching the soccer games. And then mm-hmm. they see us. Another thing that comes to mind is the the history of the Catholic worker here in the United States. Mm -hmm. I don't think there has ever, ever once been an ad anywhere for the Catholic worker. Mm -hmm. It has had enormous uh, uh, impact on bringing Catholic social thought to now generations of young people. Mm -hmm. Now, there's lots of fragmentation within the worker movement, but in terms of marketing, non-existent, exactly what you say. People go and visit a, a worker community someplace or other, and they come back and they tell everybody about it. And they say, why don't you come the next time I go and see what you think? And it's it's had an enormous impact. Well, I don't know if we should pin you down on on this. <laughs> when are you running for office? Oh, and so when I was actually reading the questions, I, I chuckled because it's something I'm planning on doing. Um, oh, 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 that's a I, surprise, isn't it? That's a surprise. <laughs> yeah, it's something I'm definitely planning on doing. Um, I would say unlikely for 2024. Um, I'm I am looking at filing fees and stuff like that for just doing like a pure on paper candidate race, you know, for something local. Um, I don't have the time nor the energy to run a full scale campaign, but if I can throw 500 bucks to get on the ballot and I run for mosquito commissioner, like great, put me on there. Um, So I'm looking at things like that, but more likely um, once, uh, the campaign cycle is over once the presidential campaign has come to a close and I can breathe a little bit, uh, 2026 is where I'm aiming at, uh, you know, for either, a you know, right in congressional race or city council, um, something like that, um, where I can have my name on the ballot, um, ideally, obviously. Now, uh, in terms of donations, <laughs> I think I'm at liberty to say <laughs> You'll be interested in this because of your work in music ministry. That uh, Mark Ruzan's choir director, choir, parish choir director, has donated twenty five hundred dollars to his campaign. I, that's awesome. Totally, totally. Uh, so you have untapped resources at hand. <laughs> Yes, sure. I'm, I'm actually good friends with the uh, with the choir director at my parish, and he doesn't have the money to throw around, but maybe someone else does. <laughs> what would happen? What would happen if uh, the National Committee were to discover that uh, some generous donor, perhaps addled as much as generous, but some generous donor had just directed $100,000 to the party. Reactions? Well, great, first. Um, and second of all, it would be like, how can we spend this now? Like, how can we not know how? Well, really, right? Like, it, it's true. You know, when we're going into a presidential cycle, going into 2024, um, one of the things that pe- most people would recognize was a mistake from 2019, 2020 was that we were a bit too conservative with how much money we spent on things like ballot access. Um, by the end of it all, it, we got to like July or August and we had, I think like $50,000 
cash on hand. And it was like, why did we save that? Right. We could have spent a little more. We could have used it on something. Um, and so if that money was in the bank now, the first thing would be like, where can we get on the ballot? Like what filing fees can we pay? What petitioners can we contract with? Like, let's maximize this now. Um, and obviously the hope is that, and we know this is true, right? The more you're on the ballot, the more people see you, the more people join, the more people donate, and it, you know, kind of feeds itself, right? So with with the campaign cycle, it really is very much of a, whatever you put in, you're going to get back and more, right? You're going to get that back and more in terms of membership, in terms of uh, donations, in terms of votes, things like that. Um, and so that would be my first reaction. <laughs> Well, here in California with our senatorial candidate, Mark Roussan, we were flabbergasted to find ourselves with 1500 extra dollars. <laughs> and because it was pro bono, uh, Mark was able to put together an exciting video of him nice. bicycling bicycling up <laughs> to a group of people to give them the message. And so now we're looking for places to post that. Nice. But as you say, if the word is to go out, it must first and foremost be personal and close to home. And as you say, we're here for the long haul and the long haul is a a hard crawl. Yes. So as always, we end today with a gospel for today, which is a very short gospel, but as always, uh, directed to our, our hearts. Jesus said to the crowds, Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy and my burden light. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you so much, Marcos. Thank you very much, Marcos. Thank you very much for having me. This was a pleasure. Um, of course, you guys have my email. You have... Uh, my Facebook, whatever, always feel free to reach out if you need anything. And I hope to see you both at all the next national committee meetings because I'm sure and, you have nothing better to do and, and, <laughs> than to listen to. And, and, to we listen know to you, and we know you have office hours. <laughs> yes. Come to my office hours. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, we can tell from our discussion this morning that you have ebullience to share. Absolutely. So, Godspeed. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. Have a good day. <laughs>